All right, people, here we are. Day 9,000 <laughs> of actually having my my ankle bracelet. When is this going to end? Is it me or do these always seem like therapy sessions? <laughs> it's crazy. Right? Yeah. This week, we got more frustrations, y'all. Oh, man. This week, we're like, <laughs> what is going on? What's oh, happening? <laughs> so. I, I think, I'm sorry, guys, if we get more out of this than you do. <laughs> but we're just keeping it real. This week, uh, we're going to talk about actually some of these frustrations because things are a changing. As mm -hmm. uh, you all know, you know, the, the saying used to be that um, that change is inevitable. Remember that? Everybody used to say change is inevitable. Our parents used to say that. Now it's like change is constant. It never <laughs> stops. And so here we are, you know, basically sliding into August, almost the end of November or of, of July and November. <laughs> yeah, it might as well because it all seems like one big <laughs> nightmare of a month. <laughs> Exactly. But uh, here we are, end of July, sort of, and more changes have happened. So I'm going to kick this off and talk to you guys a little bit about, and in all seriousness, about things that you should be preparing yourself if you're going into buying a house today, or even refinancing for that matter, because it's true, okay? Rates are artificially low, thanks to the Fed, meaning the Federal Reserve. So rates are fantastic. However, there's this little hidden real wizard behind the curtain. A couple of things to mention. Number one, lenders are getting slower. Here's what happened. Rates drop to an all-time low. Sounds great so far, right? Problem is, lenders weren't prepared. So guess what? If you have a staff of four that was doing 10 loans or 15 loans, now those four are doing 30 to 40 loans. Guess what? It is taxed, the system. So they are understaffed. Most lenders are understaffed. And we all know it takes a while to hire someone. Think about it. You got to put the ads out. You got to do all the interviews and then sift them out and then hire and then make sure that they get their equipment and then train them. All this takes a lot of time and a lot of resources mm -hmm. and resources, not just money, by the way. It also takes the people that you have to train them have to stop doing what they've been doing. They got to go train now. So it creates this molasses effect, I call it, which is the slowing of your process. I mean, I'm even seeing it. You know, I hired another person because we're just so slammed that it's taking us a little bit longer to, to even get pre-approvals done. So we have lenders that are, have slowed down. Mm -hmm. And then we have the appraisal industry. There's a lot of appraisers, believe it or not, that still don't even want to go do the appraisals because they're afraid of catching COVID-19. So that's one. And two, because there's so much loan volume, guess what? They're all booked. Mm -hmm. So it's taking forever to even get an appraiser to accept the appraisal order. And then when they do accept it, they got to go and book it based on the availability of the person letting them into the property and then their availability so here we go. And on top of that, by the way, not a lot of people are entering the appraisal industry. So it's a very aging industry. Why? They don't get paid as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. After 2008, things changed big time and their income went down and they still have to drive all over the place to do these appraisals. These and then you got big, gigantic lenders that are basically lowballing them because mm, it's true. they don't want to pay them. Yep. So here we are. Imagine you, if I told you, okay, I tell you what, yeah, I'll give you the job, but I'm going to pay you half and I'm going to double your commute. Uh, would you take that job? Probably not, but that's right. what's going on. So we have a bottlenecking effect. So there's a little bit of drama going on. So prepare yourself and be reasonable and realistic with the timelines. There's also something that's disturbing me a little bit. In spite of all the things that I've said, I'm starting to see people get super aggressive and go in with no contingencies. I'm a little worried about that because if you're going in with no loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, no breathing contingency, I just said that things are taking a little longer. Why would you put your money in jeopardy that way? You gotta be really careful. One thing is being assertive and I get that. Look, we're in a competitive market and there's very low inventory and you're going to talk about that in a second, Fatima, but 
we also have to be realistic. Don't set yourself up for your disappointment and the disappointment on the other end as well. Because remember, there's two parties here. There's you, the buyer, and then there's the sellers. Mm -hmm. let, me ask you, let me ask you about that because recently, you know, to even be a player with even some comp with competition, there's been a ton of competition lately. There's still low inventory. I mean, I've been seeing news articles that are saying that inventory has spiked up and maybe in some areas, but really, I mean, I'm like showing like, let's say a property for, I have, I have a client that I'm only able to show like one house a week. It's like ridiculous. Right. And then in order to even be a player, if they do like the property recently, we've had to, you know, waive the appraisal and loan contingency to even just make our offer wow. look or appraisal and inspection contingency, but we kept the loan in order just to kind of make our offer look appealing would yeah. you just would you say don't do that like just be, it's too risky even for appraisal waiving appraisal uh, and here okay so this is somewhat of a complicated question to answer because but let me let me dive in so here's what i mean by this you and i'm talking to you the the borrower the person getting the financing okay a couple things one is be 100% prepared. Whatever your lender asks for, give it to them. Mm -hmm. Right now, we cannot short circuit things. What I'm noticing is that everybody, well, can you just give me estimates? Well, can you just kind of give me a ballpark of what do you think I qualify for? No. Let's get detailed because estimates and guesstimates and all these things, that's what I consider to be financially being passive aggressive. Let's not go off of that. You don't want to put in offers based on guesstimates and things. Put in a full application, get you fully underwritten. Let's find out exactly what you look like so that that way I can answer that question and say, you know what? Yeah, we can go non-contingent because they're solid. Mm. Even if the lender decides to change things, like for example, let's say a lender decides that you need three months of reserves of your total mortgage payment because lenders can change the game whenever they want all the way up until you sign the final documents. They could change it, okay? Once you sign the final documents and the loan is done, they can't. But up to then, yes, they can. It's their money. Remember this. Here's the reality check. The reality check is that the lender is the one who owns that house, not you. If you're putting 20% down, let's say, which is pretty robust, right? Mm -hmm. The lender owns 80% of your house. Who do you think owns that house? It's not you. Until you pay that house off entirely you really don't own that house they can foreclose on you if you owe 20 g's mm -hmm. you miss a payment right so let's be realistic here so get fully approved let's know our numbers and then if you need to go non-contingent then we know but remember also that just because you go non-contingent on a loan with the with the loan contingency that doesn't mean that the loan's going to be done if your appraisal comes in low. If your appraisal comes in low, here are the following options. Number one, you pay the difference in cash. Two, you renegotiate the sales price. Mm -hmm. Three, we do a rebuttal, right? Meaning we fight the appraisal. Or four, you walk away. But if you've removed the loan contingency, you're probably going to lose that deposit. So how often does a rebuttal of appraisal actually work? Though? I mean, it's probably very minimal. And five to 10% of the time? Because when you do a rebuttal or what they call a reconsideration of value is the technical term, mm -hmm. you have to give them three additional comps, meaning sales of properties to substantiate the value that we say it actually is. So you've seen you can't come up with that. You're dead in the water. But you have seen success in that. Yeah. And I've had success in that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But again, you know, you, you don't go, you don't go into a gunfight with a knife. We, yeah. We're going to have to have those at least three comparable sales that substantiate and they can't be you know five miles away right yeah and to go off a, to go off and you know so when you look at comparables you want to make sure it's within i always go within a quarter mile away and if you have to you go half a mile away if you have to you go 0.75 miles away and then one mile away if there are really really limited that's the most that's the yeah. most and you have to make sure they're within 
the past six months, but most of, most of the time they're going to check within the past three months, three. you know, so three months is really what, you know, cause every, like every six months is kind of like a change in, in, um, just the valuation. But right now, the way things are, things are changing rapidly. So you always want to do three months because that will tell you exactly what's happening around. And then within, I would say two to 300 square feet difference max, you know, the appraisals will go around like up to five plus or minus um, the subject square feet, but yep. really keep it within like two, 250 square feet difference. And, you know, so those, those factors will definitely play you know, it has to be very similar to your type of house. You know, if it's two story, find two story. Right. If it's um, an older home and built in the fifties, find something around that similarity of in, you know, but not a, like a home that was built in 2010 or 2018, 100%. very different, right? So those, you have to make sure when you, uh, when you assess value, it's very similar to the property itself, um, the subject property, but to go off of that, um, but yeah, it's, it's insane. Like, I mean, I, you know, multiple offers now, I mean, it's been gradually happening this way, but there's multiple offers. There's offers higher than definitely becoming way higher than the, um, the list price. And then, um, yeah, waiving people are waiving contingencies again, like, so, I know in a crazy market. So let's close this up because we wanted to keep this as short as possible. So here's the deal. Get prepared. More importantly, and I've talked about this many times, make sure you get a very solid team. Mm -hmm. Make sure that your realtor and your mortgage professional work great together, number one, and two, really know their stuff. Now more than ever, I will tell you that that's probably the best advice anybody, not just me, can give you, is make sure you have an absolute best of class team. Number one, two, make sure that you're approved give with all full documentation, a full loan application, not estimates, not give me an idea. No, no, no. Full. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're prepared. So then that way you can go in and be very aggressive. All right, guys, if you need to get a hold of us, guess what? We put our phone numbers actually on where our names are at. Ah, we came prepared this time. All right, guys, have a great day. Thank you. And reach out to us if you have any questions. Take care. All right.